Hello and welcome to the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series are creative conversations with visionaries about craft, creativity, and collaboration. I'm Liz Hinline. I'm a creative director as well as a film, TV, and VR director. Um, we're going to do 20 minutes of shop talk and then we're going to have 20 minutes of answering questions from you guys, the global audience. So please write in. You, you are having like a, an exceptional guest today who is brilliant, a visionary executive producer, very hard to get a hold of. So if, if you have questions, now is the time to ask. And without further ado, I'd love to present Isaac Bolden. Isaac. Oh my God, look, it worked. Here we are. Hi, how are you? Very good, and yourself, how are you? I am great. Isaac, you are prolific. You have worked on a, excuse my French, shit ton of shows. <laughs> and it's pretty impressive. And so just off the bat, for me as a filmmaker, what elements or, or what genre or what, what stories make great doc series? Yeah, no, that, that's actually a good question. Um, I, I really think that you can take this, this it's, a, it's something about being able to touch the heart and soul of a particular story. So finding a particular piece about that story that you can kind of dig deep into, um, that folks can kind of can actually identify with. I think that's, that really helps tell a great story. So it kind of takes you into what's going on. Um, it kind of can personalize it for the audience. So I feel that that's a, uh, a big way to kind of determine if you can kind of tap the heartstrings uh, and if that story can be that, if you can find a way to tell it in that manner, I think you know, that will kind of give you a broad way of reaching a wider audience. And as a EP, how do you know it's a doc series and not like a feature doc or a narrative series? Um, Honestly, I don't make those types of decisions as much as I, you know, I, I think the, there's the discussions about that and trying to find out what's the best way. It really determines how long the story can be told, what kind of elements you think you can put in to make that story. So I think, you know, it does vary, you know, because nowadays you look at it, some of the, even the feature docs, you know, they are actually documentaries that are over, you know, a serial type of a scenario. So they'll have three or four parts to them as well. So, you know, I'm, I, I, I really believe that the term feature versus, you know, just a straight serial doc, you know, they're kind of the lines in my mind emerging because of the way content is delivered today. So, you know, but there are still those specific stories that are just feature docs and you tell a you know 90 minute two hour type project and you've started out it seems to me in the very beginning like you were one of the first ones to do a, a police procedural um out in the field and and tell me how that came about and how you even knew that this would be something that would excite an audience well i, I honestly you, you don't know you know, you, you pray and hope that that is something you put a lot of time and development into it. Um, I think for us, I was working with a really good group of individuals at the company that I was with at Granada. And uh, what we did was we looked at this development. We looked at the, the, the story points of the show, of, of the piece of the show itself. Um, we tried to find ways to, to, make it interesting enough to the audience and make it kind of immediately personal to them. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we developed a very good relationship, I could say, with the, the police and the departments. Um, I worked with a, a very, you know, talented executive producer at the time, uh, John Kim. And, you know, he just was able to understand how to get in there, how to get them to believe that we can tell the story from the police procedural perspective. Um, and we, once we took it to a &E, it, it became something that was still a test. You know, we were still trying to find how to really tell that, how do we kind of make it episodic? Um, and from there, it kind of, you know, it continuously took off. So today it still runs and it still has a, you know, an audience and seems to still affect a lot of folks. That's incredible. I hope you still have a piece of it. 
<laughs> in my heart, of course. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe not in your bank account, but. <laughs> exactly. and, um, and so what, what brought you to, to, to you know, documentary and doc, doc storytelling? Where, where, how, did you, how did you find your way into that? Um, interesting story. I was, you know, kind of coming off of another project that I was working with and someone had told me about um, the work that um, Alex Gibney was doing at Jigsaw and they were looking to get into more of the TV world. And for me, it seemed like a great fit. I had done a lot of different types of genres and a lot of different type of work. You know, I'd done some, you know, alternate reality shows you know, did some dangerous shows, but this seemed to kind of suit me and fit well with kind of where I was in my career. And so I kind of started working with them and have been um, working with them for, for quite a bit of time and finding ways to continue to, you know, tell that, that, that wonderful story. Well, it's really interesting, especially the the last two series I was looking at, I mean, in the, the beautiful hip hop one, and then the the cooking show one, and it, it's very, definitely very elevated storytelling, um, mm -hmm. as well as being super cinematic. And how how does that come about? Because that that's such a is is that just the way documentaries are told now, or is there like a, a signature premium style that people are using? Um, you know, look, I, I think every project is is really different in its own right. And at the end of the day, regardless of what your title is or whatever happened, I think it's most important to find a way to put the right teams together. And I think we've been able to do that. I think that's what kind of leads the charge because, you know, this is a huge bit of creativity that goes into these items. And there's a lot of people that are involved. So what becomes important is trying to find all of the right pieces that can give you this new view and new opportunity to tell that story. Um, you know, you look at that cooking show, you know, we found folks that we felt were the right individuals that can kind of give us that, give us the right message, how to tell the right story, how to, you know, make it so personable. Um, and I think that's what kind of helps set us apart. You know, it's about how we set up the teams, how you kind of work with the individuals and the directors and the, the producers and so on and so forth. And I think that's a big part of, of why it seems like it has a signature because that mostly that signature is about, you know, it is very good storytelling in a very provocative way of telling it, but it's also the signature of finding the right individuals, marrying them to the right product um, and then that way, you you all have an environment that you can create in, and that folks feel free to do whatever they feel they need to do to get to the end game. And wait, remind me of the name of that show. It's um... uh, the the cooking show was Salt, Fat, Acid, and Heat. It was based on a book by Suri Sami Nozrat. So I have a couple of questions on that. So so there's this this book that's a bestseller. Was that like an automatic, okay, we, we want to make a documentary series for that? Or was this like, did it have, like, where does something, how does that something bloom? And, and then where is your, your, your point in it? Because I noticed a very long litany of executive producers in the title cards and, and, and what is each one doing? Um, I, I, I will say that that actually came from one of our first cooking shows, which was called Cooked, um, from Michael Pollan. And um, we had done a four-part documentary series. We had teamed up with Michael, um, you know, it's just as I was getting there, and they had teamed up with Michael to put together this series. Um, and in that series, when we were making that series, one of the guests on that show um, was Samin. And, you know, we just followed her career. She had just had such a great personality. Um, she was just very interactive. And I think if you've seen Cook, you can see how she was just in that, in that environment. And we felt that that would be a wonderful person to work with. And later down the road, she came out with the book and, you know, the team, you know, the, the, the teams at Jigsaw decided that, hey, listen, you know, we think we can make a, another great show out of this. Um, and we started, they started working with them to uh, put together salt, fat, acid, and heat. And then with all the different, so on a show like that, what is your, what are, thing, what are things you have agency over? 
the most important thing for me is really about you know the budget itself, understanding how we're spending the money, the protection of the produ the, the production team, um, a lot of the legal end of things, trying to make sure you have all the right releases, you have you know the right contacts with folks, you've you know contracted with everybody so that once you give that product over to your broadcaster, they can feel that um, you know you've done your due diligence, you've you know crossed all the I you want to say cross all the T's and dotted all the I's so that they feel that they are well protected and they have the right to actually go ahead and show that show. So that's a lot of my role. That's a lot. And so 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 are you like the money man? Um <laughs> Uh, I guess you could say that, yes. You know, there's mm -hmm. that point person, oh, go talk. Oh, oh, you want a crane? Oh, oh, go talk. <laughs> Are you that that's, person? That's exactly right, you know. <laughs> and, and look, you know, I've always looked at it as once you put together, my job is to put together a vision of how the show could be made, how much it could cost, and find out how that, what the size of that team is and who are the right people to kind of put on that team. So that's the big piece of my work. Um, and so you, you really are kind of, once it's all done and you're settled and ready to go, it's really about, okay, you know what? Now we have this large sum of money. Um, what you put on paper, while it looked good in the beginning, it, it's gonna change. And so, yes, when those requests come along and they're like, you know, we really wanna do this, what do you think? You know, you discuss it creatively and you find the ways to make it work and you, move some money from left to right and you know, hope that uh, it's the right decision. Well, in this documentary world, which I'm less familiar with, what are you basing that budget on? Is it a script? Is it a treatment? Like what's, where's that come from? Uh, a lot of different elements. It is a treatment, you know, sometimes it is a book, you read through the book, um, but it is a treatment. And then it's really about what is it that you think you want to do to try to uh, find a way to translate what was on those pages, mm -hmm. you know, into a video, into a, you know, to, to, to that medium. So I've done it for quite some time. And, you know, for me, I, I, I can't necessarily answer how that happens as much as you start this. I guess, you, you know, I looked at it from my started very much in the very beginning and doing a little short, a lot of short films and um, how you kind of visualize what you think the scene is going to look like, what you think you need, how many things you think you need to put it together. And that's kind of how I go about it. Mm -hmm. So you do kind of draw on some of your other experiences, but you are looking at that treatment, that's that the information that provides you with some type of roadmap so that you can say, okay, if we want to go to Japan, you know, what are the things we're going to need to do to do that, to make that happen? You know, how many folks can we go with? And then you start kind of putting it together from that perspective. You know, in, in the film business, they have the, you know, the, you put it together by, by, by day by day. And it's very, to me, very similar how I, my approach to that. It's what is it that I want to do on that particular day? What is it that I think we're going to want to do when we get to a particular location? How long do we think we really need to be at a specific location to actually pull off and get the material that we want? How much time do we really need before we actually go to the location to um, set it up to make sure once we arrive, you know, we can kind of move very quickly. So it, it is a lot about understanding what that, you know, and then you have large conversations with the creative team as well. They're kind of like, you know, it'd be nice to have X, Y, and Z. And, so you start figuring those things out. So all of that gets put into the finalized, okay, here's the schedule. Here's what we think it's gonna cost. Here's how large we think the team will be. And did you come up more as a producer or as a line producer and then sort of gravitate towards this more senior position or, or how, what was um, it? Yes, it, that was kind of, you know, my work, a lot of my work still is today is, is, is that kind of producing line, producing work. Um, it's Literally, that's how I kind of came up. I started because I realized, you know, in my mindset about the business, a lot of folks didn't want to have to deal with the money. And so they didn't want to have to deal with the numbers. And so I felt that that was always something that I was pretty good at. 
and that became my kind of entry into the world. Um, and then from there, you start growing and next minute you know, you're, you're doing a whole bunch of different things. Do you see numbers as, are they, are they like creative to you? Like, is, oh, is yes. new numbers? 100%. You know, I think the numbers are equally as creative as what goes in the final film, you know? Because you, you are literally trying to, look, you, you, everybody realizes in this business, you get a certain amount of money to do the project. And it's your job to find a way to make it work. And not only make it work, but make it beautiful, make it you know, compelling, make it wonderful. Um, and so you are creatively, so to speak, doing a dance every day. Because you know, in the world of production, a lot of things happen. And so you, you're constantly keeping track of that and managing that and understanding that and calculating those things very quickly so that you can understand, okay, we're gonna to need to move this, we're gonna to need to make these things happen in order for us to get to that end game. And that is a creative process because you, know, you, you have to come up with suggestions, you have to come up with alternative methods as opposed to, hey, I think I really want this huge crane well, we might be able to do it in another manner. And, you know, if you can, can be convincing enough and it's, you know, that that might be a way of making it work. So there's that whole collaboration that goes back in my mind. to as I was saying earlier about being with a team, you get the right team, then, you know, every piece is a collaboration. It's a discussion about how do you make it happen? What's the best way to make it happen? You know, and you're constantly making that, that go on and, in that world and environment, that to me is what becomes really fun. That sounds very fun from your point of view. I totally <laughs> agree with that. Um, when you're putting a team together, do you like to be, do, do you focus more on your old relationships and working with people you've liked to work with before? Or do you like to reach out and go out of the box and, and try out new people? What's your... Uh, um, I think it really depends on, I'm sorry. How do you I, approach I how do you approach it when you're, you're, you're staffing? I, I think it really depends on the project itself. You know, I, I think you, you look at the project, you think about some of the folks you've worked with. I don't think you ever go into it with a distinctive decision and this is what's got to work. Um, I think you are always open to discussion. And I, I'm you know, comfortable and very happy that the team I work with, they're always comfortable with, you know, what do we think this is the best way to make this show and how, who do we think is the best, the right people? So yes, there is a roster of folks that you've worked with in the past, but there's always those, you know, new folks that you do want to try to tap into. And I think we've been able to do that quite well. That's cool. That's cool. We have a, got a lot of questions here for you, Isaac. So get ready. <laughs> okay, we're going to start with... So what is a recent favorite um, series that you've worked on? Um, well, two of them, I thought, you know, the last two, in, they both happen to be, Salt, Fat, Acid, and Heat was, I just thought, an amazing film. Uh, I, I loved working with Samin. I just think she is just an amazing talent. Besides a great cook, um, just had a wonderful personality. And I think it comes across in the film in the four episodes. Um, and I really enjoy that because I think, we, you know, we were able to travel and go to a lot of different places and kind of bring you a perspective from outside of, you know, the, the boundaries of the, the US. Um, so I think that was, I enjoyed that very much. And the other project I really enjoyed working on was uh, called Innocence Project, where we teamed up with um, the Innocence, Pro the, excuse me, Innocent Files is the name of the show, but we teamed up with the Innocence Projects and we went out and kind of tackled um, the justice system and tried to break it down into different areas of what goes on in our justice system and is it really justice at times and kind of shining a light on that. So I, I really enjoyed that. In one of those episodes, we spoke about a person that actually just got out was released just around the same time of our film was ending. So, you know, it is that type of, you know, emotional, you know, you know things that I look for and I enjoy the most because it seems like you're kind of giving an, a look into a story that other, you know, 
could go unknown to most folks. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of let folks see what's going on and how things are happening. Oh, totally, totally. And what's beautiful is, you know, what's interesting about the filmmaking today is even like reenactments are, they, they don't feel staged, let's say. They, they, they feel very organic into the storytelling. Mm -hmm. And um, what do you see? Because you, you started before like the streamers were really up and going. How do you, have you seen the documentary storytelling um, change or transform? Um, you know, listen, I, I think, I look at it from the standpoint of, I, I can't necessarily, is, is a, to me, the transformation is the, 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 the desire for more to be made, you know, because I think every story is told differently and can be told differently. Um, so I think that just, there are just more people out there that want to tell those stories. So that to me becomes the largest transformation. How you tell that story all depends on who is the person behind and who's in charge and what is it the, how, what is the message that they wanna get out mm -hmm. and how do they deeply, they wanna get into the story and how deeply can they get into the story? So I, I think to me, that's kind of what that transformation is. You know, you, you look at, you know, back where doc filmmakers were, you know, they, they, they scraping by and not to say that they're not scraping by today, but, they, they are seem to be more in demand because there is a lot more opportunity to tell individual stories that are not known to the wide public. Mm -hmm. And because we have so many ways of, you know, delivering that material, that to me becomes a large transformation. It's like, oh, you've got all of these places that now want to put their stamp on something. So they're looking for material. And if you have the right story and you can be that person that, that brings it to them, then, then you have that opportunity to get your story out there. So that to me is kind of, you know, the transformation of not necessarily of filmmaking, but mm -hmm. the, the necessity and the, the desire to, to have more. Interesting. A lot of these questions here are about this of the pitching process. I don't know if, is that something that you're involved in at all? Not necessarily. I, I don't. I, I mean, very early in my career, I did a lot of the pitching. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, nowadays, that's not something I really deal with. Um, because it seems like that's that's part of going back to what you've been saying is that the authenticity and 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 voice of the show and, and why you feel it needs to be made is the importance in, in the pitching is the is the importance of why why now and and you know the question is why now and why why you basically um yeah coming across with that and um hannah asks as sir how many projects do you have you worked on do you work on each year oh um it can vary it you know it's there's a, always a bunch of projects and <laughs> as they say in various stages of production and development so you know i can work on anywhere from seven to eight you know and still have two or three that you're you know trying to figure out and work you know work through and you know putting the budgets together, putting the schedules together, figuring things of that nature out. So, and then you'll have maybe two or three or four or five of them that you're actually in production on. Um, so it, it, it varies. Some years are good and some years are, are better, I'll say. <laughs> How, um, so what would be the shortest time period from let's say start to finish to the longest time period that you've been on from start, like you've been on the show for, till it got made, X amount of time. Um, the shortest time period, I, I'd have to say probably about nine months, nine to ten months. We had to we had a project we had to get out very quickly, and I think that was about nine to ten months. Mm -hmm. um, the longest one, probably about a year and a half, maybe two years. We just did a project for. Uh, discovery called hate and that took us about two years 
which is not that long, honestly, in a, in the concept of when you make a feature or something, two years is like, that's your money raising section, <laughs> right? Right, yeah, yeah exactly. Actually, um, so you actually go about that. Okay, so uh, Valerie asks, how important do you think it is to acquire life rights and or book rights to a story that is known and also considered public domain? Good question. How important do I think it is to get life rights? Or book rights. To or book rights. That is in public domain. Hmm. I, well, I, I don't know if I had the right answer for that question as much as I think it's always important if you're trying to get, if you have a relationship with this individual who you're trying to get life rights with, that becomes the most important piece because then you have a relationship, you've expressed to them what you're thinking of doing and how you wanna do it. Um, and then you have them involved, you know, mm -hmm. and then that, and that helps you gain access to be able to possibly tell a part of the story that no one else was able to tell or to, to reach a part of that individual that nobody else was able to reach. So. I think that's what be, it becomes most important. Um, but do you but do you feel if it's a public domain thing, is that necessary to sort of piece to go to market to to get people to? If it's about the Holocaust, and the, would you need um, specific rights to get people interested? I guess that's sort of the question. Um, you know, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that. Honestly, think about it exactly. Yeah, I will have to think about that. Um, Kaylin asked, This is a cute question What is a normal production day like for you? <laughs> um, I don't think any of them are really normal. Um, a lot of the times, the day is about communicating to a wide group of individuals working on the project. You know, whether you're speaking with your director, whether you're trying to work through some particular shoot plans, um, whether you're trying to understand graphically how something is going to work into the scenario, um, whether you're having a conversation with a location because you are trying to shoot there, Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it really varies, um, but most of the day is spent really trying to communicate with folks to make sure that we're getting what needs to happen done um, in a timely manner. Because, you know, making these shows, you're in a finite period of time. Um, while, you know, it seems like, you know, a year or a year and a half is a long time, they stack up and come very quickly. And each and every day you are trying to accomplish something um, because you, you know, you, you're, you're burning and you're, you're burning through money and being able to know that you've spent the day well um, is important. Have you had any mentors coming up in the business? Um, I, I, I can't say per se any mentors. I've, you know, I, I consider some of the folks that I've worked with, you know, to be mentors because we, you know, share so much and kind of, you know, share our philosophies on producing and things of that nature. And, and so I've had close relationships in that regard that I've, I very much cherish. Um, so when you were coming up, did you have, like, did you just learn by doing or were, like, was there someone that Taught you what um, I did. I did learn a lot by doing, you know, filmmaking wasn't my first, you know, real work. Um, I did a lot by doing and did a lot by reading. I uh, read a lot of books, broke down a lot of scripts, actually produced several films for, you know, students at the New York Film Academy. So, you know, it was a lot of learning by doing and going out there and trying to understand a lot of different things about the business, mm -hmm. you know, from what things cost to what's the legalities and what do you need to actually um, uh, have your lawyer deal with. 
and 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 how to get a good lawyer. <laughs> and how to get a good lawyer. Very important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Finding the right lawyer because you have to audition for them as they audition for you as well. Um, mm -hmm. um, and I had a thought that I, that just escaped me. Um, uh, Tiffany asks, was your journalistic background the spark that lit the flame to your desire to become a producer? Or did the opportunity drop in your lap? First, I'd say I don't have a journalistic background. Um, I, but the opportunity did kind of drop into my lap. And I like to think that I just happened to be at the right place at the right time because of the work that I had done in the past and the types of projects that I had worked on that um, I, I came around in the right moment that there was a need and I seem to be the person that can help uh, uh, fill that need. And that's kind of where I've been ever since. Looking back at, at how, you know, now that you're seasoned, when, what things did you learn along the way? What are a couple of the bigger things that you learned? Oh, this is what an EP does. This is what an EP should not be doing. Um, it, it, <laughs> I, I think that you're learning all the time. I can't, I don't want to make it seem like, oh, you, you're a certain position and you think you know it all. Mm -hmm. you're, you're constantly learning, you know? I, I think you are. I think, you know, I think one thing you realize to me most importantly is treat all of your folks with respect. Mm -hmm. You know, we run, we, this is a hard business. You know, we, we work a lot of crazy hours. There's, it's very demanding. And because of that, you've got to find ways to keep people motivated. You've got to find ways to, to want them to give their all every single day. And res respect goes a long way to helping you get the project to where it needs to go. Um, and that to me is what becomes really important when you're, again, putting together a team and understanding what needs to happen because you need those people and they you know because at the end of the day you cannot do it on your own so everybody is different i used to have a boss that says i treat everybody equally differently <laughs> 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 you know but he would give everybody the attention that they needed so that they can do the job that was required mm -hmm. and i think if anything i learned that, that that's a big piece you, know, 100%. you work for somebody, you work with somebody for two, three years, you know, you, 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 you're, you're embedded together and mm -hmm. finding ways to motivate and help them overcome and help them flourish, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately helps the, the, the project and yourself as well as them. Totally. Um, on that, Cassandra asks, what is your advice for someone starting out post-grad who wants to be a documentary filmmaker? Don't be afraid to start at the bottom. Mm, that's good. Tell me more. Well, I, I say that because when, when I first got into this business, I was a PA. And I didn't mind being a PA. You know, you, you get told to do a lot, what to do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you are the grunt. But you know, you realize, you know, people in small places have a lot of power. You know, so from my perspective, you can learn a lot looking up. And and that to me is is um, something I think folks nowadays they feel they need to be at the top and they need to be doing this because at the end of the day, when you're out there, if you feel you want to be the director and your project can't go because you can't, because I conceived it and I know I need to direct it, understand what that means. You've taken on the full responsibility for all these other seasoned individuals who are looking to you for guidance, which means you're going to have to have it all together. You're going to have to have, you know, I don't want to say all of the answers, but you're going to have to be the leader. And if you're not ready to be that, you need to know that within yourself. Because there's a lot of professionals out there that are very, you know, they love their work. You get the best DP, but they are wanting to make sure you're giving them the right direction and they have a good opportunity to collaborate with you. So you've got to figure out a way to either decide you're okay 
if your project doesn't necessarily need, you don't need to be the person in charge, but giving it to somebody and winding out, finding out how to learn from that process, um, that's fine. But if you feel that you need to be that individual, that it's me, it's mine, I need to know that there's a lot of responsibility that comes with that. And with that responsibility comes the money, comes the people, comes the project. So be ready to accept all of that. Well, exactly, 100%. And it is about, in this community, repeat business. It's about, yes. you're not going to go burn a &E networks and expect ever to work with them again. Exactly. And, you know, and to that point, you know, networks, these folks, they're, they're there for a period of time. They're always looking to move up to, and I say the people you're working with at a network. So if you made a decision and you worked at one network, this one person at the one network, chances are, you know, down the road, you will run into that person again. And so mm -hmm. you do want to try to make sure you've left, you know, a good feeling, you know, made them feel that, you know, that's a great collaborator. I feel I can work and do another project with that person because it is about repeat. It's about trust. It's about figuring out how that um, you can, as I always say, get to the end, which is the finalizing of the product, the film itself. And what do you wish if you had had a mentor, someone had told you as you're maneuvering in your path, is there anything you wish they had warned you or give you a heads up about? Um, let's say I'm still thinking on that one. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm still working, um, I'm sure there'll, be, there'll come some times. Um, and then the question I'd like to ask everyone, if, so if you weren't doing this job, what, what's another job that you could see yourself enjoying? Um, that's a good question. Mm. You know, I've always envisioned myself just, you know, riding off into the sunset, maybe just having a small little cafe, you know, small little, you know, just a certain amount of tables. The menu is the menu. You just come in for the menu and the, you know, and the, 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 the company. And you know, you just have a set group of folks and you have a small little restaurant. I can see that. What island? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a diehard New Yorker, so to me, I'd still make it a New York project. I'd make it in New York. But now that I live in Los Angeles for the past several years, I can see myself making that happen out here. I would totally come. <laughs> that would be the in place. Three tables, two items on the menu. That's it. There you go. Like it or mm -hmm. lump it. Um, <laughs> so this has been so amazing, Isaac. So if they, if people, not, let's see, is there, do you have, do you do social at all? You have social I media? I do not. Stuff? I didn't think so. So, no. <laughs> so I think it's, Maybe they can just look up Jigsaw and see, because Jigsaw has a great website. They can see what great work you've worked on there. Does that sound yes. Like yes, they can. Um, and Katie, maybe you can write the Jigsaw uh, web address in the chat. Do you know it offhand, Isaac? Um, uh, it's actually Jigsaw. Oh, gosh. Because I, I never go to it. I don't. She, she's got it. She's got oh, she it. does. I, <laughs> Jigsaw, jigsawprods.com. There you go. Yes. Now I feel really bad. No. <laughs> now we know how overworked you are. <laughs> it might still be under development as well. I think, you know, we've had some things we're making changes to. So. Right, right. This is what happens when you're a working filmmaker. You never have time to sell yourself. Um, <laughs> But this has been so brilliant. Thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge and you know, so, so much success and we're so happy for you. Thank you very much, I appreciate it. It's not something I normally do, but thank you for being kind. <laughs> thank you for all the watch. Thank you, it's like pulling, it's like the Wizard of Oz and pulling Oz out from behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> I totally prefer being behind the curtain. 100%. <laughs> Okay, thank you everyone and thank you New York Film Academy for you know always supporting the 2020 series and everyone stay safe and see you next week. Cheers. Cheers.